Hey guys, this is Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. We've received some good questions from the mailbag, so to speak, uh, regarding uh, economics and uh, modern monetary theory and monetary sovereignty and why it is that uh, things happen the way they happen. And so one of the first questions was, hey, if the amount of money in circulation um, doesn't impact the uh, value of money, what does? And the fact of the matter is, is that in a sovereign fiat environment, taxation in your own currency is what drives money. It's what gives it its value. The penalty of not paying your taxes um, is what also gives it gives our currency its value. Uh, it's not based on the petrodollar. It's not based on GDP. It's not based on any of these other things. Um, you know, we've talked about it many times. Uh, it's not really about. Uh, you know, chicken necks or oil or gold or diamonds. It's 100% about our tax system. And um, taxes don't fund spending, but taxes do provide value and they drive currency. So one of the other questions was, what about all the money that is offshored all around the world? And because that money is not in circulation in the United States and it's no longer within our economy, it's now outside the economy, we would put that when I talked about sectoral balances, we said private sector, public sector, and rest of world. So the money that's offshored would fall into the rest of world bucket now as a leakage. So leakages end up acting like the drain on our economy. That money is gone. It's out of circulation. And so what has to happen? Our government has to spend money back into the economy to keep it going. Um, and so that money, typically the offshored money, would be taxed. Not all of it would be taxed. A lot of it would come back and be, you know, spendable cash within the system. Um, but for whatever reason, the amount of money that would be taxed would actually leave the tax, uh, would actually leave the economy and go back in and be purged or deleted uh, from the system. So imagine taxation as our way of getting dollars out of the economy and imagine government spending as our way of putting dollars back into the economy. Um, I hope that helps. The next question was, if we can just print our way out of debt and we can just spend money, why is it that they would stand in the way of us having uh, Medicare for all? Why is it that they would stand in the way of us having uh, free college? What would that do to the value of the money outside this co uh, country um, if we went ahead and spent on the 99% as well? Well, first things first, the amount of money in circulation is not really the concern as long as it's been spent into the existence on uh, real goods and services. Um, think of money as just a, a way of keeping score, okay? It, it's not necessarily, hey, well, I've got this thing of gold that I can build a wall with and carve it into a golden calf. It's really just kind of like, hey, I got chips at a poker table. You know, it's just keeping score. It's like a scoreboard in a football game. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, people measure themselves by who's got the most chips. And um, so really nine times out of ten, what I found, and there's a great article that I can post here shortly, um, that talks about how the entire motive behind uh, these austerity measures and uh, a lot of the neoliberal uh, thinking is the gap, the whole gap, and nothing but the gap. And that gap is between the wealthy and the poor. Because if everybody had the same access to everything that they did, then who would really be winning, right? And they really want to win. They really want to be able to feel like they're ahead. Um, so the wealth gap is what drives a lot of that behavior. Then there's another thing inherent in our the underring of people for whatever reason, we have this bootstrap mentality. Maybe it's Calvinism. Maybe it's the pilgrims still affecting us to this day. I don't know what it is. But there is an overarching thing that I can take care of myself. I don't need your help. I don't need your government's help. Um, and so it's really more psychological than it is practical. Um, people have been brainwashed to believe that government services are bad, private sector that rapes you with uh, you know, expenses and is trying to rob you of your money because they have a profit motive, um, that basically is good somehow or another. <clears throat> well, 
real progressives are going to try to demystify and debunk that forever. That's going to be our goal. One of our economic goals is to shed the whole Calvinistic work ethic as the driving force between a person's worth, the worth of our currency, the way we view spending. Um, humanity as a whole deserves better. And so one of the things that we're going to peel into is, you know, Ronald Reagan had incredible amounts of deficits. Ronald Reagan ran incredible deficits, ran up the debt immensely, right? This debt thing that we talk about. And the debt that our government runs up, it's not like we go to Home Depot, brick out the card, stroke it down, and put a war on a credit card. That's moronic thinking, and people that say that are moronic. Um, some people just don't know better, but the people upstairs that are peddling it, they're counting on you not being very bright and, and repeating that. So when you see the memes out there saying Bush put the wars on the credit card, you know they're lying and you know they're not very bright and you know they shouldn't be trusted for economics. But the point I'm making is, is that what, what Ronald Reagan did was took modern monetary theory, the thing that I'm talking about, and he went ahead and did it in a very fascist, nationalistic, right-wing way. He invested all the money into the military-industrial complex. So who works in the military-industrial complex? A lot of poor people, right? A lot of poor people that couldn't get a job any other way, um, that wouldn't have had a good start in life. So they went ahead and they decided they would sign up for the military, they get some benefits, they go to school, whatever. The you know collateral is their life, right? So the poor fight our wars and the poor have the carrot dangled in front of them that they can go to college with the GI Bill. And, you know, they get all this discipline that they didn't get at home and blah, blah, blah. Right. So what we're offering up is that Ronald Reagan wasn't so much wrong in his economic plan in terms of spending, because we did see some great things happen. We saw an awful lot of horrible things happen, but we saw some great things happen, too. So we got to be truthful about this so we can actually get to the right remedy. We can't just be a partisan hack and say something stupid that's economically illiterate. So one of the things Ronald Reagan did was spent like a friggin' drunk man right into the military industrial complex, keeping up in the gold, uh, the cold, the cold war. Um, what that, did that do? That built an entire industry that brought money. That money was all new money. There was no corporate credit card that the government was spending to buy tanks and stuff like that. Those are all private contractors out there. Like you, many of your neighbors probably work for these places. They have good military industrial complex jobs that kill a lot of people in the end. But the point is, is that that gives jobs, right? So that's the approach they took. And what they did was they spread the, uh, the production of all those things around the entire United States. So every state in the entire country had a stake in this. So you would never cut this program because if you did, every single state would suffer. Genius, right? Evil, but genius. Now, what if we took that same strategy and instead of putting it towards the military, we don't cut spending, we shift spending, right? Because we still need our bathtub full. We're not broke. The issue isn't broke. We're not broke at all, folks. Disabuse yourself of any kind of nonsense. We print the money. We're not broke. Okay? The concern is, is that we're spending on all, all the wrong things. So Keynes, he still matters, right? Keynes had these multipliers. Some of that stuff, eh, it doesn't really work in a sovereign economy. But Keynes was still correct in the way that he looked at things through counter-cyclical taxing and spending. And yes, Juan, that's a great idea. Shift to green energy. And so when you think about that, that's exactly where I'm going with this. You don't cut spending. We need to disabuse ourselves of the idea that we need to cut spending. We need to start talking about shifting our priorities, shifting our national focus, right? So if we shift to education, well, all 50 states once again are going to have their military industrial complex pieces. They're not going to want to cut that, right? So you shift education out to every school. You shift medical to the you know single payer, and then every hospital suddenly doesn't have to worry about a bounce check. You know what I'm saying? 
So you got to realize at the end of the day, what we're talking about is Reagan understood modern monetary theory. Even tricky Dick Cheney came out and said, hey, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. And he's right. Alan Greenspan even said it, right? So you don't have to like these people, but they're your enemy in a way, right? But you can use their words against them or for us or for all of us, right? It doesn't have to be enemy. We can say, hey, listen, you guys were actually right about this. Because the real deal is when we cut government spending, when Brother Bill cut welfare, when he did his welfare reform, what he did, he sucked money out of the economy. He didn't save money. There was no surplus. That money was literally purged, deleted from the system. They didn't have it stashed over in a corner and it rumpled up, crumpled up bills in some like glass piggy bank or some football helmet bank. So what did he do? He literally sucked the economy dry. And so when he came, hey, I, I balanced the budget. All you people out there who thought the federal government had to operate like your household budget, you celebrated, yeah, Brother Bill. Woo, Bill. Bill Clinton is the man. First president ever. Balanced budget. What a, what a genius. Oh, what a great guy. But what did he do? As soon as he walked out of office, what happened? Bush didn't even have a chance to screw the pooch. He had a recession almost immediately. What do you think that Bush came in and everybody just said, oh, wait a minute, we got a president that's got 90% approval rating or whatever. Well, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's the friggin' recession. No, he inherited it from uh, Brother Bill, who cut spending drastically. Countless ways Brother Bill count, uh, just completely gutted government. Changed the way we do things completely. And you guys have been running around bragging, telling your friends, hey, Bush, Bush killed the economy by cutting taxes. Bush did a lot of things, a lot of awful things. He returned to Reaganomics, dumping money back into the military economy. The difference is, is that we had a bubble going on, a private debt bubble. And that private debt bubble, based on the housing industry and shorting of the markets, they shorted and shorted and shorted. But what had happened was, you and I, we were tapped out. We didn't have any more money. So our sectoral balances, the private sector debt, was through the roof. There was no more room for us to borrow. And we didn't have enough money because we were so maxed out on living la vida loco that all of a sudden, the entire market collapsed. We were tapped. We couldn't borrow anymore. We had no loose cash to pay our bills. So all of a sudden, everybody had to constrict and lay off. Why? Because the funnel that brings the money in, the sovereign money, the government, the federal government, had stopped spending back in Bill Clinton's time. And I'll be fair, Bush, by lowering taxes, kept the economy, kept the tub fuller by not pulling more money out of the economy. Because again, taxes don't fund spending, right? Right? Taxes just simply are a brake or a gas pedal on the economy. They use it to, when it's heated up, they go ahead and raise taxes. When it's freaking dying, they lower taxes and all of a sudden it brings the things back up. It's that simple. But money has to be driven, right? So if we don't have some sort of a uh, really awesome technology like the internet to hide the woes of the world while our private debt goes through the roof, then what you see is recessions. And Bill Clinton was blessed to have the rise of the internet on his watch. He didn't do anything fantastic. It just happened to be time and place. But so all of his contract with America stuff, all his dealings with the Republican Party, all of his cuts, all his glass steagall, all that good stuff, set us up for the crashes yet to come. So why do we dislike W so much? Because he was a murderer. He was a killer. But we should never, ever lie again. And it is a lie. Let's be fair. It is a complete and utter lie when we say that Bush ran up the debt and charged these wars on the credit card. Now, what Bush did was MMT, fascist style. We can do MMT on a demand economy over here so that it's for the 99%. You see what I'm saying? Investing in education, investing in green energy, uh, investing in our infrastructure, investing in human beings, 
investing in our environment. We can do that. So when you think about these companies that stash money overseas, that money is still in circulation, just not in our economy. So it's a leakage. When they bring that money back in taxation, that money ends up just getting deleted, which we need it to do. We need that cyclical nature of purge and spend, purge and spend to keep money moving like this, keeps the engine of the economy going. But it didn't bankrupt us. Do you understand that? It's very important you understand it because in order for you to be able to make good choices politically, good choices economically, good choices as a political movement, as you go to support candidates in the future and you start thinking about what does a progressive future look like? And these individuals talk about, well, we've got to raise taxes on the rich. Well, okay. But is that really your goal? I mean, think about it for a minute. Is that really your goal? It's not like you're funding anything with it. So you're going to be fighting about something that's not actually paying for the program that you really do care about. You see what I'm saying? The two functions are separate. So what we really want to focus on, if you're Steve Grumbine, is you want to focus on the spending side of this. You want to focus on what your priorities are. And you want to avoid stupid confrontations that don't mount to anything. Now, the tax issue is very important still. We do need to tax in our own currency. See, again, for those of you who haven't heard this before, in order for us to pay our taxes, you've got to pay it in U.S. dollars. There's no other thing that will be accepted. They don't accept chicken necks. They don't accept barrels of oil. They don't accept petrodollars. They don't accept uh, bitcoins. They don't ex uh, accept uh, editions of the creature from Jekyll Isle. <coughs> they don't accept the Bible. Um, they don't accept anything but pure cash, U.S. dollars, electric dollars, electronic dollars, digits, or paper, whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you think about what you want to fight about, do you realize how much of our gridlock, how much of our lack of progress comes from a pitched battle about taxes, raising taxes, spending, blah, blah, blah. Reality is we need to be asking, what are our priorities? What do we want? The world's our oyster. We just have to say it that way because the minute you start fighting about taxes, there's guys over there might actually have something, even though they're wrong for why. They're completely wrong for why. Because you, you ever heard that stupid si saying, oh, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. You ever heard that stupid saying? It's pretty stupid when you understand economics, at least sovereign economics. Now, if you're over there in, say, Greece, where they've given up their monetary sovereignty, the problem with socialism in their country is they really do eventually run out of other people's money because they don't have an endless supply. Every dollar that they bring in has to either be through exports, through their tourism, or through borrowing from their central bank that is not private within their government. It's a separate entity in the European Union. You see what I'm saying? Unfortunately, too many people get wrapped around the axle about the function of the Federal Reserve. It's all the rage to say all the wrong things. Now, you can dislike them. Again, their goal is to help get you in debt, to drive the economy through debt. So there is private sector debt. That's one sector of the sectoral balances approach. So you've got private, public, and rest of world. Rest of world can include leakages, like I said, for offshoring that money. So, what do you want our economy to look like? What is it that you want our economy to look like? You know, the one thing about taxation, it can change behaviors, right? So, if you wanted to make a dent in climate change, we've talked about the carbon tax before. The carbon tax doesn't fund anything. The carbon tax simply penalizes those who do bad things. It's not like you're getting this revenue from the carbon tax, you see what I mean? Those taxes are deleted. They're purged from the system. But that company pays the price because they can't create dollars. 
They have to borrow dollars or they have to sell something to make dollars. But they can't actually create dollars because they are not a sovereign entity. So carbon tax is a Pigovian tax, changes behaviors. Wall Street speculation tax, do you think we get revenue from that? Do you think the revenue from Wall Street speculation tax funds all these goods and services that Bernie Sanders or Jill Stein recommended? Do you think that that Wall Street tax funds those things? Nope. Pigovian taxes, by very definition, tend to be very temporary because they alter a behavior and eventually people stop doing said behavior and the revenue dries up, right? So if the revenue dries up because people change the behavior, what happens to the programs they supposedly funded? Oh, wait a minute, it's that debt thing again, right? It's the deficit. <laughs> Are you starting to see how ridiculous most of your thoughts have been over the last however long you've been alive talking economics? Once you start realizing, this is really simple stuff. I mean, it's so simple that a caveman could do it. The problem is not the simplicity of it. The problem is, is that you guys still believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and all kinds of other myths. And because you've been taught them all your life, like taxes fund spending, you can't break free from it because it's got a lock on you. And you have fought tooth and nail with people for years about this, haven't you? For years, you have slugged it out. God damn it, we got to raise taxes. You son of a bitch, you friggin' selfish. This is the cost of living in society. <laughs> I did it too, so that's why I know these things, right? But when you think about it, all you did was march in place. You never got anywhere because taxes don't fund spending. So you got to ask again, because I don't want to be doing this in two years, much less four years or eight years. We need to get this shit down today. We need to start getting this shit down now so that when we have the next batch of politicians, when they say moronic stuff, you can go, Dude, dude, man. Give them the give them the look. That look that tells them you're not really pitching with a full deck here, man. You're not really doing a good job here. You're not really up to snuff. I'm not sure I'm going to vote for you. I don't think you got it going on. You're going to kill our economy with stupid. Now, here's the big deal. The federal government is the currency issuer because the Federal Reserve is independent within the government. However, our states are what they call currency users. They can't print money. They can't just say, hey, I want this. States either have to tax or they have to get federal funds. Sometimes they're encumbered, meaning they have something they have to do with those funds. Sometimes they're just, hey, here's a block grant for X, Y, and Z. Now, for those of you who have heard from me before, you know that my belief is that the federal government should provide the states with a block grant based on per capita and based on certain escalators, based on uh, different demographics and people that have um, had issues in the past, maybe jobs have left those areas, etc., because... The primary motivator of companies moving from state to state is taxation. They're not necessarily looking for shipping lanes anymore. I mean, some of those things are good. They, hey, they got a port there. We can receive our products and services from there. Hey, they're, we're near the oil fields. Hey, we're near this. Hey, we're near that. But the reality is most of them are looking for tax deals, right? They're looking for the best tax deals possible. Hey, are they going to build us our building if we move our plant there? Hey, what's the labor rate like? Are they cheap down there? But if our federal government provided block grants to these areas, the states would be competing at an even level. So there would be no bad state other than the bad governance of the people they elect. And your 10th Amendment would be in place because the 10th Amendment would allow them to disperse those funds according to the will of their constituents. See, the difference is, is that instead of having to bleed people dry in areas, because what happens, think about it, in Detroit, you used to have all these jobs, you used to have industry and everything else. 
Well, the industry left, then the wealthy people left, and then what was left? The poor people, the people that didn't have an education, the people that couldn't flee. And then you have what looks like Syria. You have a war zone looking area, completely destitute, completely abandoned without hope. So we've got an awful lot of things that we can do once you guys understand economics and you stop telling people we're broke. Seriously, stop telling them we're broke. And when you think about Social Security, for example, right? How many of you guys think that that thing you get, that little notice you get to tell how much you put into Social Security, how many of you all think that that is like a lockbox? A lockbox. Full of crumpled up old dollar bills you've been putting in since your granny in 1920. Trust me when I say this. It's not. Those dollars are appropriated. Those dollars are spent into existence as needed. There is no rating of Social Security. They're lying to you. I mean, I mean, like, bold-faced lie. And they get you scared. They get you worried. And then you ask yourself, what politicians lied to me and told me that Social Security Trust Fund was in danger? What one lied to me? Oh, wait a minute. You mean it's not just the Republicans? It's the Democrats lying too? Oh, my goodness. That changes everything, doesn't it? You mean they're all liars? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Pretty sure they are. So when they talk about having to cut Social Security or they have to privatize it, you think that might be a little neoliberalism creeping into our economics here at home? Ask yourself, for real, do you really think Social Security is bankrupt? Do you? So, taxes are often used to solve for income inequality at the federal level. They, they raise them on the highest end and they you know, cut them at the low end and you got a progressive tax base, right? But what if I told you that that's not really the greatest way of solving for income inequality? What if I could tell you that we could also afford to have a federal job guarantee that would allow everyone to have a job that would set the new basement for wages? Private sector can't hire anybody unless they compete at the wage that the federal job guarantee offers. So you want to get somebody off of the federal job guarantee, well, you got to give them a better wage and a better uh, benefits package. Otherwise, guess what? You're not getting them. And the good news about that is it creates a bit of an employment scarcity issue, right? So all of a sudden that will drive wages up. But while it drives wages up, people will have more disposable income in their pockets, which will mean that those businesses, the ones that are good, the ones that are offering a service that matters, they will suddenly have a pool of people that can actually buy their products. Think Henry Ford back in the day. You know, people need to have a wage to even buy my damn car, right? can't buy my car if my employees don't make money. Labor. Labor first here, folks. A demand economy. Spending on the people. So, one final thing. They said, so what about the tax dollars going to Israel? Again, do I have to even answer that question now? Now that you've heard everything I said, do you think your hard-earned tax dollars are going to Israel? No, they're not. But what is happening is our government's resources, which represents you and I, their efforts, the things they do are an expression of who we are as a nation. So if you don't want Israel building settlements and absolutely committing an apartheid state on the Palestinian people, that would be me, I, I'm, I'm in that group, then you have a real right to complain about that. But it's not your hard-earned tax dollars. Going over the fund Israel. No, those are fr print, doom, bum. Actually, since you know Israel uses their own currency, etc., it's probably some sort of shift in a trade at the back end. But the bottom line is U.S. dollars going in and some sort of a swap in the back end, some sort of deal with uh, you know military equipment and everything else. But the point I'm making is it's not your hard-earned tax dollars. 
your hard-earned tax dollars, the only time your hard-earned tax dollars are going to work is at your state and local government. Your other hard-earned tax dollars that you spend at the federal government are deleted. They're purged. That's how they keep our dollar worth something. Anyway, those are the questions that came in from the mailbag. So what I want to do is I want to see, does anybody have any questions? I'm going to take a few minutes to look in here. If you guys have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. So I see, let's see, I'll scroll through here. And does anybody have any questions? Crystal, Carla, Nancy, anybody? Let's see. As much as I like you, Steve, if you really believe you're working for fairness in 2020, you have missed the boat. What does that mean, Kathy Bassett? Uh, let's see. Bernie proved that Social Security wasn't broke. You're absolutely right. James, I make too much sense. Thank you, sir. I am going to give you a like for that. Uh, I need a beard for that hat. <laughs> All right, I'm going to keep looking, see if we got any questions here. I do, but you burnt my mind. <laughs> All right. All right, folks. Well, look, if you guys think of any questions that you want to ask, uh, how do you feel about the threats back and forth with Russia? Well, first of all, you got to know that I believe a lot of this is pitched. I believe that there's things going on that are beyond our understanding that, unfortunately, our power structure is set up to try to manipulate us into being rabidly angry and ready to fight. I believe there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that is set to, you know, this is Eurasia versus Oceania and all the other stuff. I really don't believe there's any reason for war whatsoever. I believe our United States government, our CIA, has gone in there and created more trouble in Syria, has created more trouble around the world, and has, in essence, been the spark to the tinder to cause many of these problems. So what do I think? My suspicion is we're going to end up in some sort of a proxy war. I don't think we'll go head to head, but that's just my take on it. Uh, what would you say to people who say $15 will bankrupt local small businesses? Well, first things first, what I would say is this. When you have a federal job guarantee, like what I just talked about, instantly people will have more money. So the local small businesses, if you do a federal job guarantee versus the $15 uh, minimum wage, it will set a minimum wage, but it will have people with more money in their pockets. So when they're in those local communities, they will be spending into those businesses. That's the way this thing works because money has a natural helium effect. When you have the natural helium effect, even the wealthy get their money. Instead of trickle down, it's pour up, you know. So the idea here is give the people at the bottom the money first. Don't let it trickle down to them. Give it to them. Spend it at the bottom and let it rise. And that will keep the cycle going this way. So everyone is able to actually um, survive with dignity. Uh, let's see here. Poo -poo. Steve has multiple degrees. Yeah, I have an MBA and a Master of Science. No big deal. Doesn't make me anything special. Trust me. I've had to unlearn most of it. I need something to read. Can you recommend a book or a journal? Yes, I can. So there is a blog called New Economic Perspectives that Stephanie Kelton started. It's got some of the best writers around like J.D. Alt, William Black, um, uh, L. Randall Ray, um, a whole host of individuals, uh, Joe Firestone, um, etc. And there's a Myth Fighter, which is Roger Malcolm Mitchell. And you'll find Myth Fighter handles the Monetary Sovereignty School of Thought and the New Economic Perspectives handles the Modern Monetary Theory School of Thought. Um, there's another book that is must-read for every one of you, and it's called Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds by Warren Mosler. And right there, if you read that book, it will open your eyes to an incredibly new world, and it will allow us as a nation, as people, to be able to have health care, to be able to have college, to be able to live life with dignity and solve uh, for income inequality and solve the environment. Stephanie Kelton, you got it right there, Kevin Cook. That's exactly how you spell it. Why do we pay federal taxes if they are deleted? Because federal taxes are what give us the value of the dollar. By paying that money to the federal government and they delete, they purge, they purge those dollars from the system. 
by purging those dollars from the system and also by knowing that you'll go to jail if you don't pay them, that keeps the value going. You can't pay it with anything else. You have to have U.S. dollars. That's what keeps the money going. Uh, let's see. 100% uh, tuition reimbursement. I, 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 Suzanne, I wish I could read all this in live terms, but because of the way my screen is, I can't really see it. But I will try my best to answer this offline. Uh, thank you, Jabari, for putting Myth Fighter up there. Um, let's see. Yes, and great link there, Ellisworth, EllisWillingham.net is great. Um, yes, money is a cycle, circulation loops. Think of, yes, great, great. Um, let's see. Go back to the other post, Steve. Offer, yes, I do offer a lot of links. I always do. You need to write a short summary of what you have just shared as 101 Economics of MMT, especially state level spending capacity, people may get it finally then. You're right. Um, that is exactly correct. I think the thing that made it all click for me was when I finally realized that we print the money. Money isn't intrinsic. It's not like there's some like that vault somewhere that just has all the money and it's just the static amount. See, back, back in the day, you had a pile of gold and it was a pie. And you know, you remember the old pie charts? You would look at all the slices you know, and it's like, hey, if we slice it further, that gold is going to be worth even less. And that's where that quantity of money theory came in, right? Well, since we got rid of the gold standard, it's really now based on products and services. Do we have something to do? If you see a junked up bridge, we can pay to have that fixed. Now, the state governments, because they're strapped for taxes, a lot of times you'll see states struggling mightily. And then the worst thing, and this is what infuriates me, is unfunded federal mandates, when the federal government could easily fix that. So, um, but, um, so Ms. Scora, I, the, the answer is sectoral balances, and I will definitely post a link for that. Let me see here. I'm going to go up here and see if there's anything else. Can I make a graph for people that are not good at math and stuff? As a matter of fact, we have a graph that shows the sectoral balances, and it actually shows where the federal spending cuts and rises, it shows where private debt rises, and it shows where recessions hit, and it shows each one of them, and guess who put it together? Stephanie Kelton. So um, we've kind of co-opted that to write a little bit in there. We've got a meme of our own. I'll be happy to share it into here. If, if one of my admins that's watching can find that meme, go ahead and pop it in there. If not, I'll do it later. Um, but it's it's really it's really simple when you start thinking about if we have full employment if you know that's the only time you start thinking about cutting spending is full employment or if we're a net exporter in other words we're we're bringing money into the country because we're selling goods and services and we have full employment then all of a sudden government spending would kind of be redundant and at that point in time you probably want to slow that down because otherwise your economy would overheat. So you see, when people try to say we can just print forever, when they just say, oh, yeah, they're just saying print whatever, that's not what I'm saying. So you know they're lying, right? I would say they're ignorant, but they don't even ask me the question. They just, they just you know, what are you saying? Yeah, they, whatever, right? The fact is, is you've got to understand the sectoral balances. Once you understand that, it's like an equalizer on a, on a radio, you shift it, you go, you say, okay, this is high, this is high, so we have to spend, or this is low and this is low, so we should cut. It's just the way the balances work. Um, but the point is, is that we're so far removed from worrying about like hyperinflation or anything, because that's usually what gets thrown at us, right? Oh my God, what about Zimbabwe? What about Argentina? What about Weimar Republic? And, you know, it's just like, whenever you have a pegged economy, pegged to a commodity, it's just like having the gold standard, right? The more dollars you spend, the more that slice of pie gets shrunk and the less it's worth. And then all of a sudden you get hyperinflation. There's all kinds of things that go into that. And it takes an incredible amount to get to where hyperinflation happens. I mean, it's an absurd thing that would make it happen. And in this country, we have tried, we have done QE, which never makes it to the public. Quantitative easing is just an interbanking dollar deal where they're swapping where debt goes. It's not really ever hitting the real people out here in the, in the world, right? So the only way for money to ever make it into the economy is through credit, through exporting, or 
to our government spending. And since we have some fetish, some bizarre fetish of cutting spending, well, there you go. Now you know why we're struggling. Let's see. Yes, hyperinflation is the bugaboo. Yes, and I have an article for that. It's called uh, Zimbabwe for Hyperventilators. And uh, we'll get that out there. You guys can read that. See, you probably covered this and I missed it. But how do we cut the national debt and do we want to? First of all, the national debt is simply treasury bills. It, it, it's, it, people buy them. It's like a savings account at the Fed. It's not debt at all. We're not borrowing. and It's not like that. So what happens is, is that there's this debt. In other words, this is, all the, this is the amount of treasury bills that we've sold. People let them mature. They have them to stabilize their own currency. If everybody cashed out at some point in time all their treasury bills, we would pay them U.S. dollars. So the printing press, no problem, guys. Here you go. We can never go broke on debt denominated in our own currency. We can't. It's that simple. We are the printing press. It's that simple. You've been duped and you've been lied to and you've been led down a million rabbit trails trying to make you fear so that you're always willing to take table scraps. I'm here offering you up a solution to help you stop taking table scraps and demand more from your elected officials. So let's see here. So, so they show this huge number to scare us. Bingo. That's exactly what they do. Really big number. Because you're scared. I mean, you're looking at your bank account. You got 150 bucks in there. 17 trillion. Holy shit. What are we going to do? That's going to pass on to our kids. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yes, really big number. Scary, scary. Fact of the matter is, is that it's not. It's not debt like you and I know it at all. So, which is why we off Gaddafi and Libya. Okay, so... Libya, you know, whatever Gaddafi wanted to do, Gaddafi wanted to create an African uh, currency. He wanted to be the center for that. Unfortunately, by going with the gold standard, okay, he would have set himself up for a whole slew of problems later, okay? Doesn't matter. Point is, is that, yes, dollar hegemony is a big deal. We are absolutely economic hitmen. Um, I can't speak to the specifics of that. I've read a bunch of things about it. But I wouldn't speak in it in an authoritative way because I believe that a lot of stuff is out there. You have to def really, really, really parse what's real and what is like, hey, I think that sounds right. So I'm not going to get into that because I don't know enough about it to break down the conspiracy theories, etc. Um, I know that there's a lot of truth to it because I have read some reputable sources from Counterpunch and some others that spoke to it. And I felt like, okay, that makes sense. But I don't know enough about it to speak intelligently about it, Suzanne. Um, yes, he wanted to run the tables on us in the Mideast with the dank. And that's very possible. And he would have been able to cut us out, maybe. Um, but chances are we would have gone and done just exactly what we did. And we would hear Hillary cackling. We came, we saw, he died. Ah. Um, anyway, but just remember what I said. When you have a gold-based currency, again, your economy is constricted to the amount of gold you have, period. So if you have to print more because you've got more expanding economy... All of a sudden, now you're devaluing or debasing your currency. This is where you hear all the gold bugs talking, because this is the logic. So what he did was put a cap on his economy. His economy would have been stuck. And so it's a bad deal. He would have been stuck and whatever. But the point is, is that gold standards are not good standards for a growing economy. They're just not. Um, let's see here. Let's see if we got anything else. Um... And all right, I actually don't see any more questions. If there are more questions, I'm willing to take them offline up. Oh, politicians don't want to fix immigration because they would have to pay full price for cleaning their houses and mowing their lawns. Sad, but probably true. In any event, look, folks, thank you very much. I'm going to try and do this more often because I can give the speeches and stuff like that. And I enjoy doing them. Um, but I think it's really good to get us talking about economics and what we can do with this knowledge. Um, I have a whole bunch of ideas. Once you start talking about ideas, that's where we can give and take. Just remember so much of what is out there in policy space right now is a counter to the idea that, hey, you made bad choices. It's the Calvinist's way of thinking. 
It's all about choices. You made bad choices. I'm not going to reward your bad choices. You know? So they try to penalize you. And that's where a lot of this comes from. It's not some economic deal. It's really a socio-political deal. And it's really about shaming people. And that's why I don't subscribe to it. Everybody makes mistakes. Why in the world should you be a permanent underclass because you made a mistake? Where's the hope in that? Where's the uh, American dream in that, right? You know, let's make America great again. Really? When was it ever great, folks? Seriously. I mean, for some people it was, but for real, probably not so much. I do want to make America great for the first time. Anyway, you all have a great day. I'm going to lie, sign off and uh, love you guys. Think about questions. Send them to us. If I can't answer them, I'll give you links that can. Um, again, I don't consider myself to be the expert. I just know enough about this that I feel confident talking to you. And I know really great sources for how I can get the answers. And I can get you links to get you reading and thinking for yourself. But again, austerity, all this cut and spending crap, federal debt, oh my God, all that is to scare you into behaving a certain way. And it's about control. So if you guys want to live a life more fulfilling, stop playing in to the austerity-minded games. This is Steve with Real, Real Progressives. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Have a great day.